Thank you for coming on such short notice, Sir Thomas. Good of you to come. Will you take a seat? I believe you know Master Rich. Indeed, yes. We're old friends. Master Rich will make record of our conversation. Good of you to tell me, Master Secretary. <laughs> believe me when I tell you, Sir Thomas. No, that's asking too much. But let me tell you all the same. You have no more sincere an admirer than myself. Not yet, Rich. If I might hear the charges. Charges? I understand there are certain charges. Some ambiguities of language I should like to clarify. Hardly charges. Make a note of that, will you, Master Rich? There are no charges. <laughs> oh, Sir Thomas, it amazes me that you, who were once so involved in the world, are now so much removed from it. It amazes me, too. The king is not pleased with you. I am grieved. Yeah, do you know that even now, if you could bring yourself to agree with the bishops and the parliament of this realm, there is no honor to which the king will be likely to deny you. I am well acquainted with his grace's generosity. You have heard of the so-called holy maid of Kent, who was executed for prophesying against the king? Yes, I knew the poor woman. You sympathized with her? She was ignorant and misguided. She was a bit mad, I think. And she has paid for her folly. Naturally, I sympathize with her. You met her. You admit that you met her. Yet you did not warn the king of her treason. How was that? She spoke no treason. Our conversation was not political. My dear boy, the woman was notorious. Do you expect me to believe that? Happily, there are witnesses. You wrote her a letter? Yes. I wrote advising her to abstain from meddling with the affairs of the princes and the state. I have a copy of this letter, also a witness. You have been careful. I like to keep my affairs regular. Sir Thomas, there is a more serious charge. Charge? For want of a better word. In May of 1526, the king published a book, a theological work of sorts entitled A Defense of the Seven Sacraments. Yes, for which she was named Defender of the Faith by His Holiness the Pope. By the Bishop of Rome? Or do you insist on Pope? No, Bishop of Rome, if you'd like. It does not alter his authority. Thank you, you come to the point quite readily. What is that authority? I simply answer, to the best of my ability, certain questions on canon law which His Majesty put to me, as I was bound to do. Hmm. Where might I find this published? You will find it very ably and set out, Master Secretary, in the King's book. The book published under the King's name would be more accurate. You wrote that book. I wrote no part of it. I do not mean you actually held the pen. It was from first to last the King's own project. This is trivial, Master Cromwell. I should not think so if I were in your place. It was from first to last the king's own project. Only two people know the truth of the matter, myself and the king. And he will not perjure himself. Why not? Because evidence is given on oath. He won't perjure himself. He won't give evidence for this accusation. What more do you want? <sighs> Sir Thomas, is there anything else you would like to say about the king's marriage to Queen Anne? I understood it would not be asked that again. Evidently you understood wrongly. These charges... They are terrors for children, Master Secretary. An empty cupboard to frighten children in the dark, not me! True. True. To frighten a man, there must be something in the cupboard, must there not? Yes. And there is nothing in it. For the moment there is this. I charge you with great ingratitude. I remind you of many benefits graciously given and ill received. I tell you that no king of England ever has had, nor could have had, so villainous a servant, nor so traitorous a subject such as yourself. The words are not mine, Sir Thomas, but the king's. Believe that. I do. I recognize the style. So I'm brought here at last. You brought yourself to where you stand now. Yes, still, in another sense, I was brought. Yes. May go. For the present.
I don't like him so well as I once did. There's a man who readies the gale and will not get out of the harbor. Do you still think you can frighten him? Oh, yes. What will you do? We'll put something in the cupboard. What? Whatever's necessary. The king's a man of conscience. And if Sir Thomas More will not bless his marriage, then he wants Sir Thomas More destroyed. Is it? Boat! Howard, I can't get home. They won't bring me a boat. Do you blame them? Is it as bad as that? It's every bit as bad as that. Well, it's good of you to be seen with me then. I followed you. Were you followed? Probably. So listen to what I have to say. You're behaving like a fool. You're behaving like a crank. You're not behaving like a gentleman. And I know that means nothing to you. But what about your friends? And what about them? You're dangerous to know that don't know me. There's something further. You may have realized by now that there's a certain policy in regards to you. The king is using you. That's clever. That's Cromwell. You're between the upper and nether millstones, then. I am. Howard, you must cease to know me. I do know you. I wish I didn't, but I do. I mean, as a friend. You are my friend. I can't relieve you of your obedience to the king, Howard. You must relieve yourself of our friendship. No one's safe now. And you have a son. You might as well advise a man to change the color of his hair. I'm fond of you, and there it is. And you're fond of me, and there it is. Well, what's to be done, then? Give in. I can't give in, Howard. You might as well advise a man to change the color of his eyes. I can't. Our friendship's more mutual than that. Well, that's immutable, is it? The one solid point in a world of changing friendships is that Thomas More will not give in. To me, it has to be, for that's myself. Affection goes as deep in me as you think, but only God is love right through, Howard. And that's myself. And who are you, man? It's disproportionate. We're supposed to be the arrogant ones, the proud fanatic ones. And we've all given in. Why must you stand out? You'll break my heart. Well, do it now, Howard. Part us friends and meet us strangers. Daft Thomas. You say we'll part us strangers, but every word you've said has confirmed our friendship. Oh, that can be a remedy. Norfolk, you are a fool. You can't place it before home. You haven't the style. Now, hear me out, Howard. You and your class have given in, as you so rightly call it. Because the religion of this country means nothing to you one way or the other. Well, that's a foolish saying for a start. The nobility of England has always... The nobility of England, my lord, would have snored through the Sermon on the Mount. But you'll labor like Thomas Aquinas over a rat dog's pedigree. Now, what's the name of those distorted creatures you've all been breeding at the moment? An artificial quarrel, not a quarrel, Thomas. Don't deceive yourself, my lord. For we've had a quarrel since the day we met. Our friendship was but sloth. It can be cruel when you have a mind to be, but I've always known that. Now, what's the name of those dogs? Uh, marsh mastiffs? Bog beagles? Water spaniels! And what would you do with the water spaniel that was afraid of water? You hanged. Well, as a spaniel is to water, so is a man to his own self. I will not give in because I oppose it. I do. Not my pride, not my spleen, nor any of my other appetites, but I do. I. Is there no single sinew in the midst of this, that there is no appetite of Norfolk's, but is just Norfolk? There is. Give that some exercise, my lord. Thomas. Because as you stand, you'll go before your maker in a very ill condition. Now steady, Thomas, and you'll have to think that somewhere back along your pedigree, a bitch got over the wall.
What Englishman can be whole without awe? The canvas and the rigging of the law. Forbidden here, the journey master's whip. Hearts of oak upon the law's great ship. Where are you going? Uh, I finished here, sir. You are the foreman of the jury? Oh, no, sir. You are John Downsy, a general dealer? Yes, sir. Foreman of the jury, does the cap fit? Yes, sir. <laughs> so now we'll apply the good plain sailor's art and fix these quicksands on the law's plain chart. Sir Thomas More, you've been called before us today at the House of Westminster to answer the charge of high treason. And, though you have heinously offended the King's Majesty, we do hope that even now you may forthink and repent of your obstinate opinion that you may still taste his most gracious pardon. My lords, I thank you. Albeit, I make my petition to Almighty God that he will keep me in this, my honest mind, until the last hour that I shall live. As for the matter you have charged me with, I fear from present weakness that neither my wit nor my memory shall serve to make sufficient answers. I should be glad to sit down. Be seated. Master Secretary Cromwell, have you the charge? I have, my lord. Let me read the charge. That you did conspire so traitorously and maliciously to deprive our king, liege Lord Henry, of his undoubted certain title, supreme head of the Church of England. But I have never denied his title. You refuse the oath tendered to you at the Tower and elsewhere. Silence is not denied. And for my silence, I am punished with imprisonment. Why have I been called again? On the charge of high treason, Sir Thomas. For which the punishment is not imprisonment. Or own deaths, my lord. Dare we for shame enter the kingdom with ease, where our lord himself entered with so much pain? Treason or not here. The death of kings isn't in question, Sir Thomas. Death, which comes for us all, my lords. Yes, even for kings he comes, to whom amidst all their royalty and brute strength, he will neither kneel nor make them any reverence, nor pleasantly desire them to come forth but roughly grasp them by the very breast, and rattle them until they be stark dead, so causing their bodies to be buried in a pit and sending them to a judgment, whereof, upon their death, the success is uncertain. Now, Sir Thomas, do you stand upon your silence? I do. But, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, there are many kinds of silence. Consider first the silence of a man when he is dead. Let us say we go into the room where he's lying, and let us say it is in the dead of night. There's nothing like darkness for sharpening the ear. And we listen. What do we hear? Silence. What does it betoken, this silence? Nothing. This is silence, pure and simple. But consider another case. Suppose I were to draw a dagger from my sleeve and make to kill the prisoner with it. And suppose his lordship there instead of crying out for me to stop, or crying out for help to stop me, maintained his silence. That would betoken. It would betoken a willingness that I should do it. And under the law, he would be guilty with me. So silence can, according to circumstances, speak. Consider now the circumstances of the prisoner's silence. The oath was put to good and faithful subjects up and down the country. And they declared his grace's title to be just and good. But when it came to the prisoner, he refused. He calls this silence. But is there a man in this country who does not know Sir Thomas More's opinion of the king's marriage? Of course not. Because this silence betokened, nay, this was not silence at all, but most eloquent denial. Not so, Master Secretary. The maxim is, Qui tatit consentire. 
The maxim of the law is, silence gives consent. If therefore you wish to construe my silence betokened, you must construe that I consented, not that I denied. Is that what you in fact construe from it? Is that what you pretend you wish the world to, the world to construe from it? The world must construe according to its wits. This court must construe according to the law. I put it to the court that the prisoner is perverting the law, making smoky what should be clear light to discover his own wrongdoing. The law is not a light for you or any man to see by. The law is not an instrument of any kind. The law is a causeway, so upon which, as long as he keeps to it, a citizen may walk safely. In matters of conscience... <laughs> the conscience? The conscience? The word is not familiar to you. By God, too familiar. I am very used to hearing the mouths of criminals. I am used to hear bad men misuse the name of God, and yet God exists. In matters of conscience, a loyal subject is more bound to be loyal to his conscience than to any other thing. And so you provide a noble motive for your own frivolous self-conceit. Not so, Master Cromwell. Very impure necessity for respect of my own soul. Your own self, you mean? Yes, a man's soul is his self. A miserable thing, whatever you call it, that lives like a bat in a Sunday school. A shrill, incessant pedagogue about its own salvation. But nothing to save its place in a great state, under a king, in a great native country. Is it my place to say good to the state sickness? Can I help my king by giving him lies when he asks for truth? Will you help England by populating her with liars? My lord, I wish to call Sir Richard Rich. Sir Richard? I do solemnly swear, I do solemnly swear, that the evidence that I shall give before the court shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. <clears throat> so help me God, Sir Richard. So help me God. Take your stand there, Sir Richard. Now, Rich, on 12 March, you were at the tower? I was. With what purpose? I was sent to carry away the prisoner's books. Did you speak with the prisoner? Yes. What did you say? I said, supposing there was an act of parliament to say that I, Richard Rich, were to be king, and not you, Master Moore, take me for king. That I would, he said, for that you would be king. Yes. Then, he said, the prisoner? Yes, my lord. He said, I will put you a higher case. How if there were an act of parliament to say that God should not be God? This is true. And then you Silence! Say Continue. Then I said, ah, I will put you a middle case. Parliament has made our king head of the church. Why will you not accept this? Well, he said, Parliament had no power to do it. Repeat the prisoner's words. He said, Parliament had not the competence, or words to that effect. He denied the title. He did. In good faith, Rich, I'm sorrier for your perjury than my own peril. Do you deny this? Yes, my lords. You know well, if I were a man who heeded not the taking of an oath, you know I need not be here. Now I will take an oath. If what Master Rich has said is true, then I pray I may never see God in the face, which I would not say a word otherwise for anything on earth. This is not evidence. Is it probable? Is it probable that after so long a silence on this, the very point so urgently sought me, I should open my mind to such a man as that? Do you wish to change your testimony? No, Secretary. There were two other men, Southwell and Palmer. Unhappily, Sir Richard Southwell and Master Palmer are away in Ireland on the King's business. It has no matter, I have their deposition here, in which they state that being busy with the prisoner's books, they did not hear what was said. Is it not obvious that after so long a silence on this, that I should believe that? He would have instantly called these men to witness. Do you wish to change your testimony? No, Mr. Secretary. Sir Thomas, to what purpose? I am a dead man. You have had your desire of me. What you have hunted me for is not my actions, but the thoughts of my heart. It is a long road you have opened. For first, men will disclaim their hearts, and presently they will have no hearts. 
God help the people whose statesmen walk your roads. Then the witness may withdraw. I have a question to ask the witness. That's a chain of office you are wearing. May I see it? The Red Dragon. What's this? Sir Richard has been named Attorney General for Wales. For Wales? Why, Richard, it profits a man nothing to give his own soul for the whole world. But for Wales? <laughs> now I must ask the court's indulgence. In the matter of this... No, no, it cannot be. The case rests. The jury will retire to consider the evidence. Considering the evidence, it shouldn't be necessary for the jury to retire. Is it necessary? No, sir. Then is the defendant guilty or not guilty? Guilty, my lord. Prisoner at the bar, you have been charged with... My the lord! My lord, when I was practicing the law, the manner was to ask the prisoner before pronouncing the sentence if he had anything to say. Do you have anything to say? Yes. To avoid this, I have taken every path my whining wits would find. Now that the court is determined to condemn me, God knoweth how, I will discharge my mind concerning my indictment and the king's title. The indictment is grounded in an act of parliament which is directly repugnant to the law of God. The king in Parliament cannot bestow the head of the church because it is a spiritual supremacy. And more to this, the supremacy of the church is promised both in Magna Carta and the king's own coronation oath. Now we plainly see that you are malicious. Not so, Master Secretary. I am the king's true subject. I pray for him and all the realm. I do not harm. I say not harm. I think not harm. And if this not be enough to keep a man alive, in good faith, I long not to live. I have, since I have been brought into prison, been several times in such a case that I thought to die within the hour. And I thank our Lord, I was never sorry for it, but rather sorry when it passed. And now my poor body is at the king's judgment. With God my death might do him some good. Nevertheless, it is not for the supremacy that you have sought my blood, but because I would not bend to the marriage. Prisoner at the bar, you've been found guilty on the charge of high treason. The sentence of the court is that you shall be taken to the, from this place and to the tower, and thence to the place of execution. And there your head shall be stricken from your body, and may God have mercy on your soul. Thomas, drink this. My master had easel and gall, not wine given him to drink. Let me be going. I beseech you, my lord. Go back. Friend, be not afraid of your office, for you send me to God. You're very sure of that, Thomas. You will not refuse one who is so blithe to go to him. Behold the head of a traitor.
a man of greatest virtue these islands have ever produced. Moore was a man of angel's wit and singular learning. I know not his fellow. For where is a man of that gentleness, lowliness, and affability? And, as time requireth, a man of marvelous mirth and great pastimes, and sometimes of a sad gravity. A man for all seasons.